Hey everybody, this is Brandon Ford and welcome to the Blind Rage Podcast. It is 5.37 in the morning and I can't believe I am recording another commentary. Not only because of the time, but because I recorded another one earlier tonight. A feature at that. At that. And I was so exhausted after that commentary that I thought that I would be asleep before my head hit the pillow. No such luck. Insomnia is kicking my sweet, sweet ass again. So here I am with another commentary. This time it's another classic, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And yeah, I don't have a lot to say (laughs) as far as introductions go. Just, um, yeah, follow me on Instagram at writer Brandon Ford. Leave your thoughts, comments, critiques there, or you can email me directly at blindragepod81 at gmail.com. If you want to, you know, send some suggestions or recommendations or just say hi, you know, reply is guaranteed. Um, also, please check out my books on Amazon.com by going to the Amazon homepage, hitting the drop down, selecting books, typing in Brandon Ford. There you'll find my author page as well as a number of my titles. You can also find me on Audible um, by going to the Audible homepage or the Audible app. And typing in Brandon Ford, I have nine audio books up um, at the time of this recording. Anyway, I don't know when this was going to be posted, but uh, yeah, I guess that is about it. And I can't promise a very good commentary. <laughs> I can't even promise a remotely coherent commentary because I am overtired and. Uh, I just took my dial on all PM. I was so tired earlier that I didn't think I needed it. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong on that one. So, yeah, we are going to watch the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and I am going to do a three count. And if you want to join me, you can feel free to do so. Uh, if not, you could just listen along while I babble. So, here we go. Three, two, one, play. Alright. You know, I never really thought about this before, but this is kind of a a slow opener. And... Um... I know this is John Larroquette, but it doesn't sound like him at all. Oh, fuck. I didn't want to do this. I really didn't want to do this, but I have to turn up the volume on the TV because I can barely hear it. And I would do that if I knew where the remote was. Where are you? Here you are. And, of course, my TV makes a loud noise when I turn up the volume, so be prepared for that. All right, I think that's good. Um, thankfully that happened over the, uh, the crawl. So, um, yeah, so we have the grave digging scene, the exhuming of the corpse here. Um, and then you have a very macabre image of the... Well, you get the pictures first, and then you have the the uh, the cor the the corpse wired to the top of the tombstone, which is quite grisly, and it was an image that I didn't have an appreciation for, meaning I didn't 
as a, as a kid when I first saw this, I didn't appreciate how, um, how, um, what is, what, what's the fucking, I told you my brain wasn't going to be functioning. I'm not running on all cylinders right now. But I never really appreciated the ghastly imagery um, that the of these opening scenes, even though it is a little slow and 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 the camera does linger a little long, unnecessarily long, I would say. You got the radio announcer in the background who is who is telling the story of what's going on with the remains of the body being discovered and then we're going to cut to the opening titles and i have to say i am not fond of chainsaw as two words i don't like it i don't like texas chain saw massacre i like texas chainsaw massacre thankfully that was rectified by the time part two came out so but i did want to talk about the first time i saw this film i think i was aware of it for a long time but it was one of those movies you know i didn't mm, while I always loved horror as a kid, I didn't watch it necessarily to be frightened. I watched it more to be more to have fun and to go on a, a, on a ride, basically, to take a ride to like a roller coaster ride, you know, to to have a few frights, a few scares here and there. But I never wanted to truly be terrified or unnerved or unsettled or disturbed by any of the images that I would see in any of the films that I had selected. And as far as I knew, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of the most disturbing and unsettling films ever made. And I didn't think that my little nine, ten-year-old brain could handle it. Especially after seeing some of the interviews and behind the scenes and some of the clips from the movie way back in the early 90s when there was a little annual award ceremony and by annual i mean it only lasted three years called the horror hall of fame and it was hosted by none other none other than robert england and yeah it uh, came on around halloween and it lasted three years and the first two, which was original content and then by the third year they recycled uh, stuff from the previous two um, specials and um, by the by the when this started I think it started in I think it was a 90 91 92 span if I'm not mistaken and there wasn't a whole lot of horror at that time and well maybe it was 89 because I remember I remember the horror Hall of Fame 3. Because uh, they give out they give it awards too, not not many, but they did give out an award for best horror film of the year, and I think it was more, um, I think it was more to pay tribute to the horror films of. Of your did we really fucking just go I didn't even notice that hold on I want to say this um, I don't know if I'm making this up or if where I read this maybe it was in one of the many documentaries that there are about the Texas Saints on massacre or maybe it was in one of the commentaries but I want to say this before I get back to horror Hall of Fame um, 
I think everybody knows that Toby Hooper was pretty notorious for not paying the, I don't know about the crew, but the cast who were put through hell during the making of this film. And I don't think that some of them were able to make their rent. And I know Paul Bartain, who played Franklin, was not too happy with the situation. And I think one of the last things he shot, or one of his last days on the film, was the scene that just passed, where he had to go down the hill. And I am 99% sure that was really him. He didn't have any stunt doubles, because I don't think Toby Hooper could afford stunt doubles. But, um, he was not too happy, I, like I said, with the way the project was going and with the lack of monetary compensation for all of his efforts. And he, from what I remember, I like this guy here. Things happen here about, they don't tell about. Um, but uh, Paul Bartain said to Toby, I am not going down this hill unless I get a check right now. So we are not rolling camera until I get a check. And I don't know how or where, but Toby managed to get a check, get him his, it was his final check, I believe, Paul's final check for the film, for his, uh, uh, contribution to the film and he got his check and from what I understand while he's going down that hill he has that check in his front in the front pocket of his shirt um, I always thought it was funny too that when he's peeing in the in the tin can he looks over his shoulder like, you know, Kurt is going to be spying on him. I don't think there's anything that Kurt wanted to see less than Franklin peeing in a, in a tin can. But anyway, as I was saying about um, Horror Hall of Fame, yeah, it might have been, I don't know, it might have even been earlier than 90... I don't know, it might have been 89, 90, 91. I think that might have my, or maybe it was like, I don't know, fuck. Um, cause I, okay, cause here's why. I'm, I'm second guessing myself. Um, I remember the part for part three, Horror Hall of Fame three, winner of best horror film of the year was The Addams Family. And that was 91, and that was not a horror movie. So it really was the early 90s was not a very good time for horror. Early to mid 90s, as I've so often said, was not a good time for horror until Scream revived it. And then we got a whole bunch of bullshit, um, including Scream. And um, so, yeah, they had they had these segments and um, I remember the, they had a segment on Alien, and they had segment on um, they had segment on Chainsaw, and there were uh, interviews with Ed Ed Neal, with Toby Hooper, and with Marilyn Burns, and fuck. Um, Fuck, I can't remember her name. Um, the actress who played uh, Pam. So they had almost everybody, but and I think um, yeah, they didn't they didn't have a grandpa or the cook as he's known in in the film. Um, but yeah, they were talking about the the horrors of making the film and. Um, I I could be mistaken, but I remember I don't think Marilyn Burns ever told this story before, but she told the story about the scene where she's running from Leatherface 
and in in the brambles and the in the night in the forest in the bush and um in this part of Texas that they were in they they were famous for the mesquite thorns which were very um thick and they were i don't know inch or so long and they grew out of the branch of of certain trees and the tree that she ran into just so happened to have this, these musky thorns and she ran right into them and they were they were embedded in her neck and they had to be removed by a doctor um and of course you know there's the scene with the uh with the pam character i wish i could remember her name right now but i did i did no preparation whatsoever i just got up put the disc in and started recording because i knew you know i just needed to get this done so i can get some sleep but anyway the scene where pam goes into the room and uh, she finds all the bones and all the macabre uh, creations created by different um uh, f the finger, uh, ha uh, the, um, the hand made, um, that was hanging and the lampshade made of flesh and the chicken in the chickens in the cages and all that stuff. But she, you know, she trips over something and she falls into the bones and the bones are very sharp. And Toby demanded several takes of that particular moment. And she had some pretty nasty slices up her leg and so there was that and I know that uh Edwin Neal told the story many times about you know being in Vietnam and being hunted and you know the horrors of war in general and that it was more pleasant than working on this movie so and interwoven with these uh stories were um you know clips from the film which looked pretty 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 gritty and pretty disturbing and it's hard to believe that by this time i'd seen it the movie was only like 15 years old so this is like for me at the time it's like being it's like it was like mm, kind of like uh saw seeing clips of saw or something like that um i mean by today's standards yeah and um so i was while i was fascinated by the story of the film and the stories that were told about the film and the stories that uh, Toby Hooper had said, I found it to be very intriguing, but it wasn't something that I thought I could handle. That was the bottom line. I didn't, I just didn't think I could handle it. And my, a very close friend of mine at the time, a kid I grew up with named Jason, um, I don't around this time I don't remember how he got it into what planted the seed in his head about about the movie but he decided that he wanted to see it and I tried to dissuade him because I knew that he would probably want to watch it with me and I knew that I would probably not be able to say no um so I showed him the segment in the Horror Hall of Fame about the chainsaw, uh, about chainsaw, and thinking that it would kind of scare him off, it only made him want to see the movie more. And so we rented it, and I remember sitting on the couch in his living room, and he lived, he was kind of a latchkey kid where his parents were never home. They were always working. And he had an older brother who was also never home. I don't know what the hell he was doing. 
but he was never home. So Jason kind of had to raise himself, basically. And he was always left to his own devices. And um, we all, his his place, his hang, his house was a hangout. And we were always there watching movies and, you know, bullshitting and doing kid stuff. And so we rented the movie from the local mom and pop video store that I frequented. And I remember sitting in his living room and being a little unnerved uh, but right at the beginning of the film. And... Uh, uh, I don't know what, exactly what I said, or even if I said anything, but I think that he knew that I was a little freaked, and I think he himself was a little freaked, though he didn't want to admit it, and I remember him saying to me, you know how you always see uh, gag reels or, or um, blooper reels? and actors uh, flub, who flub their lines end up, you know, breaking up and having to cut the scene, or the scene having to cut because, you know, they say something stupid or they trip or they, or, you know, do something that disrupts the, the film, the production. So just think of that. Just think of these actors flubbing their lines and having moments where they're they're just so um they say something that they shouldn't have said or they they mess up their line to a point where it means something else or i don't fucking know and and i think that'll you know make you a little more at ease and honestly i think that worked so I went in just thinking about, you know, everybody breaking up because Franklin flubbed his line or, you know, fucking Sally uh, couldn't remember hers or I don't know. But to be honest with you, I don't think any of that actually happened because I don't think anybody was laughing during the making of this film because it was so so unpleasant for everyone involved and um but of course when you build something like this up in your mind to be something so extraordinary that you're going to be forever changed by it it never lives up to that and I'm not saying that I didn't um, realize the brilliance of the film, even at a very young age, but it wasn't something that was so shocking that I was traumatized, basically. Um, and so, yeah, we watched it and I enjoyed it. You know, I wasn't terrified as I thought I would be. And right before I went home, I remember this. Right before I went home, I said, I'm going to hit the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. And um, so I went upstairs. And when I came back down, I wasn't looking at the TV. I was looking at him. I think it was we were making plans or so, I don't know. And he just went, look. And I turned and I looked at the TV. And he went back to the scene where, um, the famous scene, where Sally is pushing Franklin through the woods. And, you know, the famous Sally, I hear something. Stop, stop. And then you see Leatherface come out of nowhere. And he's illuminated by the, um, the flashlight. And he paused at that moment, right, where he's got the chainsaw over his head to kind of freak me out. And uh, didn't work, but it was a nice, a nice attempt.
You know what? I always thought, or I thought after the fact, um, that weird symbol that I, I can't see it now, and I haven't seen it in a long time, but that, that weird symbol that a hitchhiker draws on the van in his own blood, I thought it looked oddly like the symbol that Prince went by for those few years where he couldn't use the Prince name due to his record label fucking uh, mishap or whatever it was. It looked kind of like that. And I doubt, you know, Prince choosing that symbol to represent his artistry had anything to do with Chainsaw. But still, it's an interesting thought. Um, so there's that. And there's, there's one thing about this movie that bothers me to this day. And it's not... You know, I really don't have anything negative to say about the production of the film or the general outcome of the film or the way it's made or anything like that, anything technical. I even think everybody does a very good job as far as performances. And I think a lot of that has to do with they were not really acting. They were in hell. Um... And especially in this region of Texas, in the, in the time of year when they filmed, yeah, they were in hell. Um, but what I what always bothered me was the way Sally treated Franklin. She was always so mean to him. And he's her brother, and he's a paraplegic. And, of course, you know, he needs he needs help. And she just treated him as this nuisance. And it wasn't even the fact that he needed to be pushed sometimes because they were not on smooth ground. They were on dirt roads and in the, in the woods and stuff like that. But even when he wanted to talk to her, she was nasty and... Um, for the, for somebody who you want to want the audience to feel sorry for, i.e. Sally, that is, um, you'd have to make her a little nicer, I think. And I think Franklin knows, Franklin knew ahead of time that this was not going to be a smooth trip and that things were not going to go well. And, you know, he even says, he even says, you know, when he's left alone in the house and he's mocking everybody saying, come on, Franklin, it's going to be a fun trip. Um, that it, he's alluding that he really didn't want to go. And that he was convinced to go, probably by Sally, being his his sister. I don't know. If, I don't know. If, probably his younger sister. And um, yeah, so they convinced him to go, and then they all leave him. So, and then he gets, you know, fucking chainsawed in the middle of the woods by this faceless or two-faced, however you look at it, maniac wielding a giant uh, saw. Another thing that I remember hearing about this, and I, I've heard some conflicting stories about how Toby got the idea for this movie, but the one that I always remember, uh, and I don't remember where I heard it, but I remember hearing him tell the story where 
He was, I believe, in a hardware store. And it was it was very crowded, as you know, hardware stores tend to be. I say that in jest. But it was very crowded, and he was in the back of a very, very long line. And there were some displays. There was this display of chainsaws over the... Uh, the front checkout, I guess. And he said that um, all he could think about was getting one of those chainsaws and just slicing through everybody to get to the front of the line. And I think that planted the seed for the script. And then, of course, the whole Ed Gein thing came in and uh, into play with the um, necrophilia and the, um, grave robbing and all that, uh, and the furniture made of, uh, of human flesh and the, and the, and the, uh, uh, the, um, masks and, and suits made of human flesh. Um, I, as I've said so many times before, Carrie... Without Carrie, the horror genre would have been a very, very different place. Or it would have been very different, rather. Because Carrie inspired so many teen angst movies, so many teen revenge movies, so many uh, uh, underdogs or nerds or, or um, victims of bullying getting revenge on their tormentors. Um... None of that would have would have happened, or that would have that wouldn't have been as prominent in the horror genre without Carrie. But I also think horror would have been very different without the Ed Gein case, because it inspired this, it inspired Psycho, it inspired Three on a Meat Hook, it inspired Silence of the Lambs. You know, it's just on and on and on, and um, d d deranged as well. This too, I think Kurt is being a dick. Where he's like, didn't you say there's a swimming hole? And, and Franklin says, yeah. And, uh, and then Kurt just says, well, Pam and I would like to go swimming, man. And he's like, he's copping an attitude as well. And instead of saying, Pam, uh, Pam and me want to go swimming, do you want to come with us? Nope. He just says, we want to go swimming. Where the hell is the fucking pond or whatever it is I don't think they ever even go swimming anyway um, so like I said the the dynamic the dynamic between Franklin and Sally always stuck out stuck out because I didn't like the way she treated him I thought she was really mean and that and as far as visuals go, I mean, there's so many, so many incredible visuals in this film. It's so well shot and not just the cinematography, but the, um, the set pieces and the, uh, the shots of leather. I think one of the most terrifying images not only in this movie, but in horror movie history, is the shot of... It's one of the last shots in the movie. But the shot of Leatherface at the back of the pickup truck that Sally is escaping in. And the way his, the sun is shining on him as he's swinging the chainsaw and his, as he's still trying to menace her... As she's having a complete breakdown and pleading for the driver to go faster. Just the way the light hits him and his movement and the saw and just everything about that image is terrifying. And um, also... 
I think of, I believe it might have been a dolly. Although I'm not sure that they could afford dollies on this movie. But I would assume, I don't know. But the scene when Leatherface is chasing Sally uh, across that field right before she gets to the gas station. Just that shot of him behind her wielding the chainsaw and her screaming and pleading for her life and pleading for help is terrifying. And you get this very large man with a very large weapon that you really don't even have to uh, put much effort into using in order to cause some severe damage and ultimately instantaneous death. So, so there's that. I, I'm lost here. I don't remember what the fuck is happening. I think they discovered that the, the who is it? Um, this is the Leatherface uh, house that has the generator. And uh, Kurt is talking about um, just giving him his guitar. I, am I insane or do they not do you not see the guitar? I don't remember seeing a guitar or him playing a, a guitar. I, I don't know about that. Oh no, this is a totally different scene. Wait, did I fuck up the names? I think I fucked up their names. Is their name Kim? I never knew what this was when he puts it in her hand. It's a tooth. I never knew what that was. Because I, I didn't... Because with the grainy VHS... Um... Yeah, I never knew it was a tooth. Um, yeah, so he's, he's, he's Kirk, right? So who, what the hell is the other guy's name? Jerry. Or am I fucking, I don't know. I'm, I am so fucking out of it right now. Um... But we're going to find that in a second because she calls after him right before they have that incredible shot of the camera going under the swing and following her in slow motion as she goes toward the house. The scene that Eli Roth oh, so blatantly, no, that is Kurt. No, I'm so fucking confused. Yeah, Kurt was the, the better looking guy. Kirk. Um, he was a better looking guy and the other guy was Jerry. The one with the curly hair and the glasses. I, I don't even remember who the fuck was going out with who, but I knew nobody wanted poor Franklin. Um, you know, I... We're about to see another one of the... The, um, the most iconic... There's so many fucking iconic images in this movie. It's amazing. And it's so simple, too. Cause, and I know this is such a fucking cliche. Everybody says this. Everybody says, you know, they're, that, that it's so effective and there's no blood. There's no gore. And it's true. But it, it bears repeating. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, we're good about to see um, Pam get uh, thrown up on the meat hook. Um, oh, there's a scene where she cuts her leg up. Yeah, because Toby Hooper demanded so many, so many retakes. Um, what the fuck was that? But oh, you know, I have to say that as bad as Texas Chainsaw 3D is and as many plot holes as it has, I think the best thing about that movie is the opening when they show the house, the farmhouse, which was rebuilt and looked exactly from what I remember. It's been forever since I've seen that movie because it's so bad. But it looked exactly as it did in the original movie. Even down to the tree that was right there. They had to make sure that the tree was just as it looked in, in Chainsaw 74. So they went through painstaking efforts to have this perfect and i think it looked great too bad the rest of the movie was so good um i'm sorry but any horror modern horror movie that is with a rapper is uh is a red flag i think we all learned our lesson when buster rhymes made an appearance in halloween resurrection that's all i'm gonna say um uh, what the fuck? Uh, and then we have um, Bill Mosley playing the cook, which was also awesome. And I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody could have played the cook, ex, ex, you know, aside from, um, Fuck, I don't know anybody's name. I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't even know what movie I'm watching. Um, but aside from... Mm, who had passed on and would have been much too old to play the role anyway. Um, but Bill Mosley, who was, who was so, such a, so, so faithful, not, that's, that's not the right word, who was so, um, um, uh, who was so, uh, taken by the original film and made that fan film, you know, Texas Chainsaw Manicure and got the role as Chopped Up in part two because of it. Um, yeah, I, I don't think anybody else could have, could have played that role. And I think he did great. And I think Bill, Mo Bill Mosley always does great, even when he's doing shitty Rob Zombie movies. Um, oh, he's still talking about the blood on the fucking van. You need to get over it now, Franklin. And what the fuck's his name? Jerry is teasing him like he's five years old. I haven't gave him a zip code. He sounds like Woody Allen. What are you doing? Or yes, I'm a man. I'm not going to do any good if I use that knife, you know? Let me do that at home. Does that... Uh, does that fucking... Alright, he is a little whiny. Uh, I'll say that. Two old shades. So Franklin sounds like he's from the South, but um, Jerry sounds like he's he's from New York. <laughs> And you didn't look too hard either. Are 
you know, it's a shame that he's really trying to make amends with his sister. And he really didn't do anything wrong. He's just being himself. And he can't help that he's paraplegic. By the way, which is never explained. Yeah, speaking of, of Pam and Saturn and retrograde and all that stuff in that astronomy or astrology book, rather. Um, I don't think that seem it, it's kind it's kind of eerie um, when she's reading uh, whose uh, I don't remember whose horoscope it was, but she says, you know. There are moments when, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, there are moments when you, you can't believe that what's happening really is, pin, no, what's happening is really true or something like that. Pinch yourself and you might find out that it is. So I think that sort of sets up what's about to happen to everybody, you know, because they're all going to be butchered, except for Sally, who gets away. And, you know, I have to, I have to say that um, the sequels aren't very, with the part two, with the exception of part two. Oh, and you know what else? I had never, speaking of part two, I had never seen um, The Breakfast Club until I was about 15. I'd never even seen the cover. I'd never seen the artwork. I was f like three or four when it came out. So, yeah, I didn't really know anything about it until somebody in my, um, in, in somebody in the class at school recommended it to me and thought it was ridiculous that I hadn't seen it. And, um, yeah, and I, uh, I rented it and, you know, um, oh, there's Leatherface cackling. Yeah, but I, to, to make a long story even longer, I didn't know that the artwork for Chainsaw 2 was supposed to be a parody of the artwork of The Breakfast Club. I never knew that. And I'm not saying I just figured that out recently, but I didn't know that um, until I was probably in my late teens. Quit goofing on me. Um, at least he doesn't say, this isn't funny. Um, which is one of the fucking most ridiculous lines that is used in every single fucking horror movie. And I hate it. It should be outlawed. Um... What was I saying? Yeah, the 16 candles. I didn't know. I just knew that Chainsaw 2 was a very different film than, than the original. I knew... Okay, that scene right there, I remember when I was watching this, when I was watching with Jason, my friend Jason, and when uh, Chainsaw... Uh, Leatherface comes out of the out of the meat locker and he does that hoo -hoo. and then Jerry has that very high pitched girly scream. That was something that we rewinded several times because we th we thought it was so fucking funny. And it wasn't just Leatherface's weird scream, but it was or 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 Jerry's girly scream, but it was the combination of both, one after the other, that we thought was so fucking funny. Yeah, we that was one of those things that we rewinded over and over again that day. Um. I, 
uh, yeah, the sequels. That's what I was talking about. Part three is not very popular. I like it. I think it's good. Um, I always did like it, and I love the trailer. I think the trailer's awesome. Uh, it's a teaser trailer, that is. Um, with Leatherface standing by the lake. Um, I thought it was kind of ridiculous that Kim Henkel thought that Chainsaw the Next Generation was the true sequel to the original or tried to say that it was meant to ignore parts two and three. Ugh, well, that movie is so fucking bad. And I can't... And, you know, this this goes to show exactly where horror was in the 90s. Because that didn't come out until... Or, well, it had a limited limited release here and there. I think it played some film festivals. Or, yeah, it had a limited theatrical release. Played some film festivals. But it wasn't released on video until 98 and it was shot in 94 um so it wasn't it wasn't part of the whole you know screen clone bullshit but yeah and plus i i was so in the 90s when i was growing up and i or i was getting older rather and i was going progressing through my teen years and i was hungry for more horror in particular new horror and the 90s there wasn't much to be seen because um in particular the slasher film um it was it was not something that you saw very often there there were a lot of really bad straight to video movies that dealt horror movies that dealt with uh it was a lot of body horror a lot of supernatural a lot of uh, vampire shit um not too much zombie stuff but it, it it was more it was more under this under a supernatural type of umbrella and i just wanted some stock and slash and i Whenever a sequel came out to a franchise that I was fond of, that was like Christmas for me. And I even convinced myself <laughs> that The Next Generation was a good movie. And it's really, really not. It's really not. Um... <laughs> I just thought it was funny the way he uh, his voice kind of cracks there. And I can't do it now because I'm so fucking out of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I convinced myself that it was a good movie, and it, and it took me a little while to to uh, to realize that it's not. And that was the end of the franchise until the reboot with the remake and then the, then the prequel and then there was years of silence before the buzz was back see what i did there um then you had chainsaw 3d which went back to the original series and then there was Leatherface, which I've still never seen because I've heard it's so fucking bad. I love it when Franklin says, get back and push down. Um, but yeah, Leather, I, I can't comment on Leatherface, which I thought was a fucking... Uh, <laughs> there it is. Get back and push it down. But why the fuck would you call it Leatherface? Could you, like... I mean, if you're not even going to try, why even bother making the fucking movie? Um... I don't know where the hell they think Jerry is. Where do they think... Do they really think he's hiding in the middle of the woods? Uh-oh, here it comes. 
Ah. And he makes those pig noises. Fuck. Um, while he's cutting up Franklin, according to Toby Hooper, there were, I think it was him and some special effects people who were, um, spitting stage blood through a, through straws that I don't know if you could even see even in the fucking 4k version. There's a scene where she's being chased, and um, Gunner, big old Gunner Hansen, in those in those big old cowboy boots to make him look even bigger than he already is. Our Gunner Hansen, R.I.P. This is getting a little too loud. I gotta, I gotta turn it down a little bit. This is really not one of my better commentaries because of all this shit. And, um... Marilyn Burns does an awful lot... <laughs> Of screaming in this especially in this this latter half and this this scene is I think or no the scene when um in Next Generation, when Renee Zellweger's character is being chased by Leatherface, and you know she's gone through the water, uh, or that little you know fucking whatever it was, um, the little body of, body of water, and um, she kind of um, bursts around the the bend, and she gets to. Um, to uh, the offices of whatever the fucking girls. Oh no, no, this isn't it. But there is a scene where I think when she gets to the gas station, rather. But it's it's reminiscent of that. In um, I don't even know if it, if I'm being very clear at all. Oh, I love this. This is fucking awesome. The way this is cut together. And those weird fucking cues. And just that room with the the naked with the lamp with the naked bulb. It's a bare room, lamp with the naked bulb, and just grandpa just sitting there. And that scene that moment when um when she comes down the stairs and she, I think she sees Leatherface and she screams or something and he's still wielding the chainsaw and he like backs up a bit and he puts the, he lifts raises the saw he backs up a bit yeah oh this is this this is it here yeah, because the same thing, the same thing happens, uh, and the same thing happens in the remake too, because yeah, you got the lead girl who's being chased, she bursts through whatever in search of of help. In this, in in the case of this one, it's the um, it's the gas station. And in Next Generation, it's that office, the trailer office, which I'm still not even sure what the hell that was for, because it was, I don't think that it was, it was, it was built as an office space just 
for whatever the fuck her name was to lure people to Leatherface and the cannibalistic family. But in there's also the same but yeah. And there's also the same thing in part in the in the remake when Jessica Beal is being chased and she bursts through that trailer where the now female family are and in all three situations or in all all three scenarios right after the the girl who's being chased bursts through the door or wherever um silence chainsaw stops and leatherface is gone Yeah, I think I, it's too low now. Fuck. I am not playing ping pong or fucking tennis with the volume. She's really good, Marilyn Burns. I would, I would have to say. I wonder what happened. Why she didn't get more R uh, roles? I know she worked with Toby again, and I can't believe that she would actually work with Toby again after this miserable experience and not getting paid anything or hardly anything. I don't even know what the fuck she got paid. If she got paid anything, I don't fucking know. But what was it? I never saw that movie. It was eaten alive, I think. And... I know. I I think I, I I heard something recently where there's an eaten alive that has I don't know. Is there more than one eaten alive that came out around the same time? And I don't know. I I don't know because I always thought eaten alive was about a killer crocodile, which I couldn't give a shit about, but. I, I think I heard recently that it's not about a killer crocodile. It's about like a fucking a maniac who feeds the bodies of the women he killed to the crocodile. I don't know. I don't know. I don't like I don't like man against nature movies. Like Grizzly and Jaws and all that stuff doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> I, I always thought that when he starts smacking her with the broom, that is such an old man thing to do. Or an old, an an elderly person thing to do to use a broom as a weapon. You just cooperate. Just let me put you in this fucking bag here, and we'll have no trouble. Oh oh oh. I can't believe she had any voice left after doing this movie. I thought it was funny um, that uh, the African-American driver of the truck who pulls over to help her toward the end of the movie when it's like daylight, um, he's driving them the the black the, the, I don't know what the company was but it's a black mamba on the on the door there was I think a blu-ray edition of the movie that was released a few years ago that was called the black mamba edition I wish I fucking had it but I wouldn't I, I think I, I I have this steel book so I'm not gonna get another one
It's not like I could even fucking see it anyway. Which is really sad. Alright, we're not going to talk about my visual disability now. It's not going to be a fucking pity party for me. Um, one of the best scenes is about to come on. <laughs> you damn fool, you ruined the door. Why can't I remember the fucking... Why can't I remember his name? He was so awesome, that guy. The um, the cook, as he's known in, in this. We, then he's known as um, Grandpa slash Straight and Sawyer. And, um, you know, I never, I never understood um, what the fuck. Um, yeah, in the in the crawl. In the beginning of part three, I could be wrong as far as who this person was, but um, in the crawl, where you know it's uh, somebody, the guy doing like the John Lark head thing, um, they say that. Um, the leader of the murderous family was W.E. Sawyer. And Sawyer is the name, like I said, from part that's used in part two, because I don't think they have a name in the, in the original. And there is a, um, a W.E. in The Next Generation, but he wasn't Leatherface. And they said he died in the gas chamber. But then again, um, Next Generation was not supposed to be, it was not supposed to have anything to do with, with three or two. I, um, the fucking birds are chirping. It's, it's probably, it's got to be close to seven or if not past. Um, what the fuck was I saying? You nap-haired idiot. Oh, Jesus. Oh, fuck what was I saying? I lost my chance. Oh, yeah. I think that, like, much like, um, George Romero and John Russo, Toby Hooper and Kim Hankel had some kind of a falling out. I don't know. Um, but I think that was why. What did I say? Did I say Toby Hooper and Kim Hankel? Yeah, I think I did. I um, I think that's why Kim Hankel wanted to make his own chainsaw incarnation. Because I guess he felt he was due. Because Toby got to make part of his, his sequel. Um, which is, <laughs> I think it goes without saying that it's, it's a lot, a lot better than, uh, Next Generation. I don't even know anybody who likes Next Generation. I don't think I've ever met a single person who liked it. Well, I did meet one person. Um, but, um... Yeah, no, it's not good. And look what your brother did to the door. Um, Scream Factory. Cause I have the, um, I think it's a Canadian edition DVD that has all of the extra scenes in it. And I think it has the alternate title, title card, The Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I think. Or it might, because I know it doesn't have Texas Chainsaw the Next Generation in the typeface that is shown on the cover. Uh, I think it does say the return. I don't know. I thought you was in a hurry. Um, 
What was I saying? Oh, fuck me. But yeah, I have the Canadian DVD that's full frame that I just got by happenstance. By it, I just found it in the Coconut Records. And I thought I was buying the next generation because like I said at that time, when it was fairly new to me, I thought it was good. <laughs> so I wanted to buy it. Um, much to my surprise, there was all these additional scenes and alternate takes and different music. And um, But yeah, Scream Factory released, um, released Next Generation on Blu-ray a couple years ago with the, the regular, what is it, 85-minute version? And then another one with... Or another, I think it's a two disc. I don't fucking know. I don't have it, but it's a two disc, I think, and it's got another version that has the the extra scenes ins inserted into the into the HD version in standard definition. And if you listen to my Slumber Party Massacre three commentary. Where I fucking bitch and moan and bitch and moan and moan and bitch about how fucking shitty that version looks that Scream Factory put out with all of the standard definition scenes that were cut from the r rated version back into the film. You would know that I have no fucking interest whatsoever. And I would not. Uh-uh. No, I don't. I don't even want to test it. There's a chance that it could be good, but I don't think. I, no, I don't think so. I'm fine with my DV, my full frame DVD, especially since I don't really watch it, and I have it extract the audio extracted, and if I want to. Oh fuck. If I want to, I'll just listen to that. Um, you know what? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm really fucking tired and I'm about to pass out, so... I think I might just make this an early, an early, um, fucking whatever. I think I might just cut it off here and put it out as like a special, um, incomplete edition. Uh, I don't know. I don't know and I don't care, but I'm tired. I need to go to sleep. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for listening and unpleasant dreams.